Second Chronicles chapter 20. Behave here. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Let's get a word from here. Read verses 20 through 23. Stand with us when you find your place. Second Chronicles chapter 20. Verse 20. Chapter 23, verse 20. The Bible says, and they rose early, talking about the people of Judah, rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa, and as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end to the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy one another. The Lord would help us tonight. We'd like to preach on what to do when trouble comes. What to do when trouble comes. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you. Thank you, God, today for your spirit that's been here in both services. I thank you for the songs and the testimonies, what we felt in our hearts, for Will's message this morning. Yes. God, thank you, Lord, for, uh, God, the opportunity to, to come back tonight with those that have been faithful, and God, to uh, preach your word, and I pray your spirit would help us, would you would anoint us, God, that we could be a blessing to your people, that we could lift up your son, and God, share with them what you've laid on our hearts. We love you and thank you for your goodness, and God, I just pray tonight, God, that we could... Uh, learn some things, be challenged by some things to, to allow us to, to draw closer to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You be seated. The story we've read from the night is one of my favorite uh, in the Bible. And the reason it's one of my favorites is because the scenario is one in which I think everybody here tonight can identify with. Uh, it involves a difficult situation that's come into the life of a person, and in this case, that person is King Jehoshaphat of, of Judah. And, and he, he was a person who was honest enough with God that when trouble came his way, he said, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to deal with this problem that I'm facing. What helps me in this story, and hopefully what can help you in this story, is that God provides us with a formula we can follow for how to deal with these types of circumstances when trouble comes in our lives. And if you know anything about the Bible, God tells us, right up front in the book of Job that man's days are few and full of trouble. So trouble's going to come. How are we going to respond or deal with that trouble? And that's what I'd like to look at tonight as we go through this story and identify some things that, that we need to do when that trouble comes our way. Well, the first thing I want you to notice tonight is the problem in verses 1 and 2. The Bible tells us in verse 1 that the people of Moab and Ammon had joined, or Ammon had joined forces and they were coming against Jehoshaphat and his kingdom. And he's told in verse 2 that there's a, there's a great multitude of these people. They're only about 25 miles from him and, and the people of Judah. Some Bible scholars suggest that these armies coming against Judah outnumbered them 3 to 1. So the enemies of the people of God are after them. They're surrounding them. And there's a lot more of them than there are of God's people. And when Jehoshaphat hears the news, he, he responds in the same manner that most, if not all of us, would respond. He gets scared, and fear grips his heart. Well, in our Sunday school class, we've been going through a book that deals with the different ways the devil attacks God's people in their minds and in their emotions. And the author puts these attacks into four categories. The devil attacks us either through insecurity, through discouragement, through guilt, or through fear. And this morning, we began our study on how he uses fear to torment us. And I thought about this this afternoon. I'm not sure there is a worse feeling in all the world than fear. I'm talking about the kind of fear that takes your breath away. 
the type of fear that makes your, your stomach hurt, that paralyzes you. And this is a type of fear that Jehoshaphat had. And it's a type of fear that many of us either have dealt with or will be dealing with. And let me say this to you tonight. Contrary to what you might think, and contrary to what may others want you to think about them, everybody battles some sort of fear. There is some area in your life, your weak spot, your weakness, that if enough pressure is applied to that area in your life, I don't care how big and bad as a Christian you think you are, it releases feelings of fear. So everybody deals with it. I almost preached from 1 Kings chapter 19 tonight on what God did with Elijah when he was attacked with that fear. And let me tell you something. If it can happen to Elijah, it can happen to any of us. Reminds me of the story I read about the little boy who had a nightmare in the middle of the night. And he had a bad dream and it woke him up. So he did what all little boys do when they've had a bad dream in the middle of the night. He got out of bed and he went into his parents' room. And he woke his mom up. She was sleeping. He said, Mommy, can I, can I sleep with you? And she said, No, sweetheart. Daddy's sleeping with me. When the little boy heard that, he turned around and shook his head as he headed back to his room and said, That big sissy. We all deal with fear. We're not the only ones dealing with it. You're not the only ones dealing with it. But thank God, I'm glad we belong to one who can give us victory over that fear. So Jehoshaphat, he has two problems here in his life. He has some foes, or he has some enemies. And because of those foes, because of those enemies, now he's also dealing with fear. So there's the problem. He's surrounded by his enemies. He's outnumbered. He's outmanned. But notice, secondly, the prayer in verse 3. The Bible says Jehoshaphat set himself to seek the Lord. And that's exactly what we need to do when we feel surrounded by our enemies. We need to make our minds up that we're going to seek God. Look at the progression here. There's the seeking. Then there's the seriousness. The rest of verse 3 says Jehoshaphat proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. You know why he did that? Jehoshaphat's not messing around with this stuff. He means business, buddy. He wants, to, he wants God to know the urgency of the situation. And if you want God to know the urgency of your situation, you start doing without some meals, buddy. That'll get his attention. So there's the seriousness. There's the seeking. And then thirdly, look at the supplication of verse 4. The Bible says Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. Verse 5 tells us that Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court, and he begins to pray. His prayer is recorded in verses 6 through 12, and I'm not going to take the time to read all of it, but there's two very important principles that you'll find in his prayer that instruct us or teach us how we ought to pray when we're in a crisis or when trouble comes. The very first principle in his prayer is that he praised the Lord. You say, now wait a second, Jehoshaphat. You don't have time to praise the Lord right now. The enemy's on its way. The enemy's going to be here in just a few hours. Forget the praise. Let's get on with the request. And that's exactly what the devil wants you and I to do when we're in trouble. He says, you don't have time to praise God in your prayer. Let's get on to the petition. But buddy, when the worst storm in our lives is coming, we better take time to praise God before we even get to our need. So we, before he even asks the Lord for help, he says, Lord, I'm going to praise you for who you are and what you've already done. So there's praise in the first part of that prayer. Here's the, the second principle. Not only does he praise the Lord... Secondly, he reminds the Lord of what he had said and done in years past. He refers to Abraham. He refers to the construction of the temple. And basically, this is what he's saying. Lord, do you remember when you said this? Lord, did you remember when you did this? And I've told you before, God loves for us to take his word and repeat it back to him. Do you know why? Because it shows him that we are claiming his word. It shows him that we are standing on his word. I heard one preacher put it this way, and I loved it. He said, God loves it when his children hold his feet to the fire. I love that tonight, to know that we serve a God that likes to be reminded of the promises that he made us. That's why he said in Malachi chapter 3, prove me now herewith. God loves it when we pray his word back to him and remind him of the promises he's made us. That's what Jehoshaphat does. Then I love his honesty his transparency, his humility in verse 12. Look what he says in verse 12. And I want you to remember now, all of his people are watching this take place. 
He's not by himself with the Lord here. He's called the people together. He's the king, and they're all looking to him for leadership. They're looking to him to find out what they should do in this crisis. And this is what he says. He says, Lord, we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. And look what he says in front of his people. Neither know we what to do. Jehoshaphat obviously wasn't a king who subscribed to the philosophy, never let him see you sweat. He didn't care what his people thought. He wasn't trying to act like he had it all together. Brother, he was in trouble. He knew it. He was afraid. And he had no problem admitting to the Lord in front of all of his people, Lord, we got no chance against our enemy, and I got no idea what we're supposed to do. Let me ask you tonight, you ever been there? Trouble comes. The enemy comes. Fear comes. And the pressure's so deep, you stop caring if people think you're bold. You stop caring if people think you're courageous. Hey, you're willing to get real with God and humble with God and say, God, I'm no match for this. I can't do it on my own. I don't know what to do. And here's the first thing to do when you don't know what to do. Look at the last six words of verse 12. Jehoshaphat says, we're no match against these enemies, Lord. I don't know what to do. But he says this, but our eyes are upon thee, Lord. I don't know what to do, but I want you to know this, Lord. We're still looking to you for help. We're still looking to you for guidance. We're not trying to take this over in our own strength. We're not trying to do things in our own way. We're still looking to you for help. And I believe when we're going through the most difficult times in our life, it makes all the difference in the world what we keep our eyes on. Just ask Simon Peter if it matters what you keep your eyes on when you're in a storm. And here's why, I believe. Because you can't look at God and the storm at the same time. As long as we keep our eyes on Him and Him alone, that storm won't look as big to us. We won't worry about how long that storm's going to last. We're not going to worry about what comes on the other side of that storm. If we just keep our eyes on God like Judah kept their eyes on him, the focus will be where it needs to be as we go through the storm. So there's the problem. There's the prayer. Notice thirdly the proclamation of verses 14 through 17. Jehoshaphat prayed and God answered, but the, the answer didn't come through a prophet. The answer comes through one of the priests by, by the name of Jehaziel. And I love how the Bible describes it in verse 14. The Bible says, and upon Jehaziel came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. I say thank God for his spirit, brother. There is nothing in this world like the feeling of having the Holy Spirit come upon you. And the Holy Spirit will do things for you that nothing else in this world can do. It'll give you power when you're preaching. It'll give you comfort when you're in a crisis. It'll give you joy for the journey and victory in your life. Thank God for the anointing when it comes upon us. The Spirit came upon Jehaziel, and he received the message from the Lord. And this is what the Lord said. You tell the people this. Verse 15. Thus saith the Lord unto you, be not afraid nor dismayed. You know what that word dismayed means? It means shattered. It's the picture of a soul crumbling in fear. He said, you tell the people this. Be not afraid. Don't be shattered. Don't be dismayed by reason of this great multitude. In other words, don't be afraid of these enemies. I don't care how many there are or how frightful they look. Why? For the battle is not yours, but God's. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. Fear not nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. You talk about good news from a far country. That's exactly what God sent for Jehoshaphat and his people. And God said to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat, you might know what to do, might not know what to do, but thank God I still know what to do. And as long as he knows what to do, everything's going to be all right. He said, I'm going to take care of this problem for you. And in God's answer to Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat's prayers, he gave them two commands. He gave the people two commands. The first command was this, stand still. In other words, don't make any kind of military preparations for battle, Jehoshaphat. You know why? Because you're not going to need them. This battle is going to be fought in a way that's different than any other battle you've ever witnessed before. And I thought one of the most difficult things for us to do in our Christian lives during trying times is to stand still. Activity is a way for us to deal with the stresses of storms. 
But God did not want his people trying to keep themselves busy so they could keep their minds off the battle that was going to take place the following day. He wanted them to stand still. And when I think of a person standing still in the midst of trials, I think of somebody who's grounded. I think of someone who's trusting the Lord. They're like that tree that's described in the Bible that stands when the stormy winds start blowing. Jesus, or the Bible says in Psalm 46, be still and know that I am God. So God said, stand still. And then he told him something else. He said, not only do I want you to stand still, I want you to stand sure. I want you to stand in faith. I want you to believe what I've told you that I'm going to do. I have told you you're not going to have to fight. I want you to believe what I've told you. I've told you you're going to see my salvation. I want you to believe what I've told you. If it's hard enough to stand still, how much more hard is it to stand still and stand sure when we feel the enemy around us? But that was God's message. That was his answer to Jehoshaphat's prayer. Fourthly, I want you to notice the praise in verse 18 and 19. The Bible tells us that when Jehoshaphat and the people heard these words... From Jehaziel. They all fell before the Lord and worshiped. And then verse 19 says, They stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Now, wait a second. Has God defeated their enemy yet? No. Were they still going to have to go out to battle in the morning? Yes. Then why are these people praising God? Do you mean it was enough just for God to say? He was going to do something to, the, to make these people praise God? You mean these people are praising God simply because he made a promise to them? That's exactly why they were praising God. They believed what he had told them. They believed what he said was going to come to pass, so they praised him as if it had already taken place. Now here's our problem. This practice to us in this day and age is extremely foreign. Here's how we are. We almost always wait to see what God's going to do before we praise him. And let's be honest, sometimes even after he does it, we still don't praise him. But all through the scriptures, God's people praised him before he ever delivered them. All through the scriptures, it was just enough for him to say it, for them to worship him. And that's one part of what real faith is, taking God at his word and living our lives in victory because of what he said he's going to do. The problem, the prayer, the proclamation, the praise, lastly tonight. Notice the prescription for victory in verses 20 through 25. Yes, sir. The Bible tells us that people of Judah woke up early the next morning. And they went to, into the wilderness of Tekoa. And when they got to this place, Jehoshaphat did a couple things. The first thing he did was give a command in verse 20. He says to the people, he stands up and says this to the people. He says, believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe his prophets, so shall you prosper. You know what Jehoshaphat was saying to his people? Guys, just have faith. Believe what God has said. Trust what God has said he's going he's to do. And we need to understand what God was asking them to do. He was asking them to walk out to the battle and basically do nothing. He was asking them to stand before their enemies and trust that God was somehow going to do all the fighting because that's what God told him he was going to do. And Jehoshaphat recognized how easy it could have been for the people to doubt. How easy it could have been for them to get cold feet. And he had challenged them and he encouraged them to believe that God was going to do what he told them to do. And I thought about this this afternoon. Jehoshaphat's message to his people is the same one that each of us who get behind this pulpit try to share with you each and every time we get up to preach a message. We basically say the same thing to you that Jehoshaphat said to the people of God. Church, let's believe God. Let's have faith in God. Let's trust him and his will. And if we'll do that, that's the way to prosper. Contrary to what the preachers say on TV, you'll be blessed. So the first thing he did was make a command. The second thing he did was had a consultation in verse 21. The Bible says, and when he had consulted with the people. Now, I'd like to have a little fun with this if I could. Because I don't know what the context of this meeting was when he called the people together. But my guess is it might have been something along these lines. 
Jehoshaphat called the people together and said, Hey, guys, God has told us he's going to fight this battle for us. And all he wants us to do is trust that he's going to do it. So how can we do this? How can we show him that we have absolute faith that he's going to defeat our enemies even though they outnumber us three to one? How can we do that? And I can see the people start looking around and scratching their heads and trying to think of some ideas. And maybe some people say, hey, how about we do this? Or how about we do that? And let me tell you, from an earthly standpoint, from a military standpoint, these are some crazy ideas that are being thrown out. Maybe one person said this. Let's leave all of our weapons behind back at camp. Let's not even take our weapons out to the battlefield. That'll prove to God that we trust him. He said he's going to fight for us. Let's not even take our weapons. And I can hear the people say, that's a pretty good idea. Or maybe someone else said, or we could do this. Let's take all of our best soldiers and let's put them in the very back of the line. Let's take all the younger and weaker and less experienced soldiers and we'll put them in front because it doesn't matter anyways. God's going to do the fighting for us. And about that, high, about that time, Jehoshaphat might have snapped his fingers and said, I got it, boys. I know what we can do to prove to God that we're trusting. We're not going to put our weaker soldiers in the front of the line to lead us. We're going to put our singers in the front of the line to lead us out. You know why? Because this is not a battle that needs soldiers. Thank God this is a battle that needs singers. This isn't a battle that needs warriors. This is a battle that needs worshipers. And when the people heard it, they said, that's it, king. That's what we want to do. So the word begins to spread throughout the camp. Get all the singers, get all the worshipers, get that praise crowd and bring them to the front of the camp. They're going to lead us into battle. So here they come. And I'll be honest with you. They don't look very impressive. They don't look very intimidating. Here comes me, Will and Ron and Jeff. Here comes the men's quartet. Here comes Ron and Patty and Susie and Terry and Jamie and Lisa and anybody else who gets up here and sings. And none of us look very intimidating or very impressive. They bring the singers up to the front of the line. They don't have calluses on their hands or swinging swords. They don't have muscles from holding the shields. But it doesn't matter. Because for this battle, thank God, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. For this battle, we need people who will sing. For this battle, we'll need people who praise. For this battle, we need people who adore the Lord and love him and don't care what anybody else thinks about it. And let me say this to you tonight. For the battles that our people in this church are fighting right now, we don't need the biggest. We don't need the strongest. We don't need the ones with the most ability. I'm telling you what we need to help them. We need the praisers to step up. We need the worshipers to stand up. We need to shout praises to God and see what he does after we do it. We need people that will praise him in the palace and in the prison. We need people that will praise him when all is well and nothing is, nothing's well. We need people that will praise him when the barns are full and when they're empty. I'm telling you, brother, we need people that will praise a God who's worthy and able to bring victory out of the most challenging of circumstances. Let me ask you a question tonight. If our church was a picture of the tribe of Judah and Will was King Jehoshaphat and Will said to the first free will Baptist church of Sefner, I need all the praisers to come to the front of the church to lead us in the battle. I need all the worshipers to the front of the line to lead us. Let me ask you a question. Would you be one of those people that were summoned to the front? If we were headed into battle and we needed the praise crowd to lead us, does your name get called? And I know what some of you are thinking. Well, Hoy, I'm not loud enough to be a praiser. Your volume has nothing to do with it. I don't get excited or animated. That's got nothing to do with it. But I bet there's something in your life that gets you animated and excited. Contrary to popular opinion, you know what praise is most about? It's not about your hands. It's not about your head. It's about what's in your heart. Let me give you an example. I saw it with my own eyes on February 13th at the hospice house in Temple Terrace. It was about 5 p.m. And my father-in-law was slipping off into glory. And I watched my mother-in-law, Miss Monroe, walk over to the bed 
and kiss him on the forehead before she leaves the room. And with a broken heart of all the things she could have said, she said, God is so good. And she's not a shouter. She don't get that animated. But I'm telling you, if I was making an army tonight, I'd put her at the front of the line as a praiser. That's what praise is about. Cal Ray said, praise is not what we do. Praise is who we are. Praise is a part of life. And that's what it's about. It's not necessarily how loud you get or how animated you get. It's about a continual lifestyle of praise to the one who's been so good to us. But I will say this to you. I believe at some point, your praise should be identifiable to other people. You want to know why? So God knows you're not ashamed to do it. I've told you this story before. Last year, we had the uh, chorus concert out in the gym. And our group was there to sing. And Lindsay was singing, so Ronald was there, and Connor was singing, so Dad was there. I think that's the first time they've both been there in a concert well Brock was there and I had duty so you know what that means similar to mom and dad's duty back there tonight wrestling him so I took him into the the side classroom and I was trying to keep him occupied and I was peeking through the door to watch as the kids were singing and they were coming to the end of the program and uh, they were singing I've mentioned before you guys know when Kevin's there he is so good at bringing that that performance to a conclusion he's just so good at knowing what testimonies to have people do and the songs they had to sing and and they were singing the the song living he loved me dying to save me glorious day is what it's called and then after that they sang uh the song statement of faith i believe that jesus died and rose again that day wonderful powerful song so i'm standing in there and man they're singing and there's about 300 people there are 350 people there and there's two hands that went up in the crowd Two hands that went up in praise in the crowd. One on the front row and one on the back row. The one on the front row was Ron, and the one on the back row was Dad. And as I I saw that, this is what I said to the Lord in that room. God, I want to be a part of that crowd. I want to be a part that feels your presence to the point that I can't sit still about it. Not because it makes me more spiritual than anybody else, but because you've been better to me than I could ever deserve. And when we head out into battle, brother, if they're putting the praisers at the front of the line, God help me to be someone who's in the front row. Why would Jehoshaphat want the praise crowd at the front of the line? Let me suggest a couple reasons as we close. Number one, it was a sign of faith and obedience. Here's why. They wanted God to know they were fully relying on him. They wanted him to know that they believed he was going to honor his word. So we're going to put the people at the front and we're going to praise him as if the war's already been won. That's the first reason. The second reason is this. Because where there is praise, there's power. Will preached on it last Sunday night. Acts chapter 16. It's the story of Paul and Silas. Verse 25, they start to sing and pray. They pray, sang praise and prayed at midnight. And the Bible says suddenly there's a great earthquake, so much so that the prisons were shaken and all the doors are open and all the chains fall off. What caused the earthquake? God chose the earthquake. But what moved God? The praises of some suffering saints is what moved the hand of God. And Jehoshaphat wanted the praise crowd at the front of the line. Because praise moves the heart of God. In my opinion, there has to be at least two things prominent in the life of every child of God if they're going to have any type of spiritual power at all. Prayer and praise. The degree of spiritual power in our lives will be determined by the level of prayer and praise we have in our lives. And let me say this something about praise as well. Praise is very little, in my opinion, about what happens in the church house. You're only here three times a week. If the only time we praise God is in church in front of other people, there's no praise in our lives. Praise is during the week and every day when you're one-on-one with God, when it's just you and Him and no one else. The command, the consultation, thirdly, there's the charge in verse 21. 
The Bible says the singers went out before the army and praised the Lord. They were singing, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And Jehoshaphat said to the people, let's go. They marched out to the battlefield, and I don't know if the Moabites and Ammonites could see them coming in the distance, but it would have been hilarious if they did. I could see them looking as this army's coming their way, and all the singers are in front, and I can hear them say, whoa, man, these guys look little. They don't even have any armor. Is that a harp somebody's carrying? Has that guy got a trumpet? What a joke. This is going to be a breeze. Then the people of Judah cleared their throats and started singing praises to God. And when the praises went up, the power came down. I can see Jehoshaphat look over the choir director and say, turn her loose, brother, and let her rip. And as they sang those praises, and by the way, did you catch what the Bible says? The Bible says they sang and praise the Lord. What do you mean, Hoy? You can sing without praising the Lord one bit. You can just go through the motions. You can sing just so Ronald don't call you out up here on stage. These people sang and praise the Lord. And in verses 22 through 25, there's the conquering. The Bible says the Lord set up ambushments against the enemy. And they began to destroy one another. Judah never lifted a finger. All they did was lift their voices and praise to God. And because they took God at his word, because they trusted what he said he would do, because they praised him even before he had defeated the enemy, God gave them such a victory. It took three days for them to collect the spoils. That's what praise can do, folks. That's what praise can do in our lives. I'll close with this story. The year was 1799, and it was Easter Sunday morning in Feldkirk, Austria. The people woke up that day and, and they were in great fear because Napoleon's armies were right outside the city gates. And they thought were, the, the armies were poised and ready to attack and overtake them. So the people in the town uh, got together this Easter Sunday morning to talk about what they should do. And somebody said, I, I just think we should surrender. We, we got no chance against this army, so what should we do? Well, within that group talking was the bishop of the town. He said, wait a minute, guys. He said, it's Easter Sunday morning. It's the day we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And there's a special way that we honor his resurrection here. So before we do anything else, let's have a moment of celebration. Let's have a moment of victory about Jesus conquering death, hell, and the grave. And so all the people said, yeah, that's what we need to do. Before we do anything else, let's let the church bells ring, sounding the sound of victory and the sound of his resurrection. So they said they began to ring those church bells, and they rang all throughout the town. And as they rang them, some of Napoleon's commanders heard the bells of victory, and this is what they thought. That must be the Austrian army that has come to this village in the middle of the night, and they are ready to attack us. And Napoleon's army said, this is a fight that we don't want to get into. And they took off, all because the church decided to sound the sounds of victory and ring the bells of praise. And if that'll send the enemy on the run, we need to do the same thing for the people in our church that we love. He's worthy to be praised. Would you bow?